so we, we wanted to, you know, we, we've done a lot of different things um, with the Gnostic restoration, doing with Gnostic practices, and, you know, one of the things that we sometimes forget to do, especially those of us who wear collars and do churchy stuff, it's easy to forget that uh, the, the links between Gnosticism and, and, and art and um, our immediate predecessors, the, the, the folks who were involved in the Gnostic Restoration, uh, that group was just chock full of artists, um, surrealist painters, poets. There's always been an overlap between um, uh, between the arts and Gnosticism because Gnosticism is visionary and creative, um, and we see the same kind of creativity even in the maybe in the Gnostic Gospels. The Gnostic um, the the people wrestled with myths and had visions and created new ways. Jordan Stratford calls them uh, New Testament fan fiction mm -hmm. um, and, and sees Gnosticism primarily as a literary movement. I wouldn't go that far, but there, there's, there's always the, the artistic impulse is, is so close to the Gnostic impulse. And, and you know, one of the ways that Sophia, our mother Sophia has manifested herself isn't just in the churchy stuff and there's nothing wrong, obviously I'm in favor of the churchy stuff but uh, in other ways of expressing ourselves too. So we wanted to sort of just make a little shift today and talk and just have more of a discussion kind of thing about Gnosticism and cinema. Um, and there's been a, a whole slew of films over the you know, past couple of years that have, that have talked about Gnostic films. But in order to sort of narrow or to narrow the discussion, because uh, a lot of people throw around the term Gnosticism and will tell you, for instance, that the Da Vinci Code was a Gnostic film. The Da Vinci Code wasn't a Gnostic film. It was, it was bad history meets bad acting. Um, meets bad theology. Maybe it's bad theology. I don't know if you can say Tom Hanks did, was a bad actor. I, come on, he's Tom Hanks. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Oh. Um, <laughs> so, so what? So, um, Father and I were working on some ideas about what makes a Gnostic film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the main things that a lot of people talk about when they talk about Gnostic um, themes in, in literature or pop culture is, is dualism. So um, this expresses itself in a number of ways in, in art. Um, most frequently you'll see it as a dichotomy between a real world and a fake world, and, and we'll get into quite a bit of that in, in the films later on. Um, but that dualism uh, leads to alienation, a feeling of, of being outside of the you know the world a feeling of being outcast um, some forgetfulness and uh, th that shows up a lot uh, and then a of remembering an anamnesis is the the Greek word that we use <coughs> so somebody's forgotten something important and then through a series of revelatory events they remember it um, again the world isn't real or is less real or is artificial You'll see that in a lot of Gnostic films. Um, there is often some kind of a fall. Uh, somebody who has a position of authority or power or, or something is brought low and then they have to return to the, the greatness, their greatness. A lot of times there's a demiurge figure. Um, and of course the demiurge is a figure in Gnostic myth who is the creator of the world but not the true God. So oftentimes uh, you'll see that kind of a figure appear as a character in some of these movies. Um, and of course, as in, in order to be Gnostic, you have to show that knowledge is the salvific element, right? So through knowledge, you come to be saved, or you come to be restored, or whatever the, the particular motif happens to be. And then, of course, the escape and the transcendence of the false world into the real world. And you'll see that in a lot of the movies that we picked here. Um, and before we talk about any specific movies, I, I do want to blow the spoiler horn here, you, we're going to talk about the endings of some movies, so <laughs> if, you, uh, yeah, if you haven't seen them, feel free to leave the room or something, I don't know, or fast forward the video if you're watching. So, so let's talk with, let's start with the, um, so let's start with the first one we were, we were going we to discuss, um, and as much as I tried to convince Father Anthony, uh, he wouldn't let me talk about the Big Lebowski. Nope. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I had to put my foot down. <laughs> even though I found a fantastic article last night um, connecting yeah. the, the, the plot line of the dude with uh, the, the Tree of Life and the tarot trumps, 
and I thought I'd made a pretty good case with it, but no. Not Gnostic. All right, so, <laughs> so let's start with the Truman Show. Okay. Which is one of the best examples, I um, think, of Gnosticism in cinema. The, the, the guy's name is Truman. He's the Anthropos, right? He's the story of, of the cosmic man who is now entrapped in a false reality, mm -hmm. which in this case is the set of a TV show. Um, and working full time to alert him to this false reality, of course, is this also exiled female character whose name was Sophie. Sophia? Um, who is battling um, Ed Harris's figure, who is the Demiurge, who rules over the TV set. And yeah, at one point, he calls himself the creator. At one point, when, yeah. when, when Truman finds out what hap what's happening, he says, who are you? And Ed, Ed Harris, from the moon, right, says, I am the creator of a television show loved by millions of people. Like, uh, a little ham-fisted, but yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because I have seen Gene Roddenberry acclaimed as the creator. Sure, yeah. I well, mean, but he, he is. <laughs> um, but the, you also see with Truman, the, the true man, one of the, one of the common themes of Gnostic films and of Gnosticism, um, perhaps one of the defining characteristics, is a sense of alienation. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the sense that the world just isn't quite right. And, and throughout that, you see Truman as a young boy wanting to travel and the teachers discourage him from, from what he and you know at one point even tries to tra take a trip and the Demiurge does everything he can as a matter of fact we find out that as the film goes on the Demiurge will, is quite willing to kill Truman rather than let him to escape and then really puts his life at risk in the attempt to escape and uh, and of course it ends with him climbing this ladder and entering into the true world I, th I think a pretty yeah you know, I mean yeah. probably the, the, uh, the ones that we looked at probably the clearest example of a Gnostic film mm -hmm. and uh, flat out good film if you ask me I mean it's it, it's really I think Jim Carrey has an interesting kind of canon of films but th this was mm. I think this was one of his uh, just a perfect role for him where he could be slightly silly but still have a seriousness about it and the the part I like about that ending, when you were talking about the ending, is he leaves, he goes out that door, and that's it. You know, you don't see what happens, you don't know what's beyond that, but it's the real world. You know, you, he can he can feel comfortable escaping the construct and and getting outside of the, the the false creation and into the real world, and it just really lets you your imagination kind of fill in the blank of what that's like. And there's also a saying that we get we hear repeated quite often that the liberation of of any one individual is an event of cosmic significance. Mm -hmm. The idea that because we are all connected at some in some in some way, that um, one person freeing themselves has a ha, has a ripple effect on liberating other folks. And I remember, if you remember, after he escapes, yeah. the TV show goes off the air, which is always liberating when a reality <laughs> TV show goes <laughs> off the air. But not only that, but you see the guy there, the old guy there, the TV show goes off, and. He kind of shrugs and puts off the TV and picks up a book. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and everybody yeah. who's who's been watching the, the show around the world, they all kind of like get on with their lives and you know try something else. So so in a sense, they're kind of they're also liberated from the false world of the reality TV show, and 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 reconnected to something else that's, mm -hmm. that's more real. Um, you know, so I think that's a good example of that, of of how how you know, there's a tendency in the West. For us to to approach spirituality in a very individualistic kind of way, um, because we are trained to be good consumers, <laughs> and, um, and 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 it's a reminder at a deeper level that our own spiritual work is in the context of the liberation of others, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Has anybody seen the Truman Show? Do you, wanna, do you have anything you want to add about it? Is uh, you covered it pretty well. Uh -huh. It was perfect. The thing that I always liked about the Truman Show too is the discomfort of everyone around yeah. mm -hmm. too. Yeah. That that this being part of this complicit lie is not something that weighs mm. easy on the soul of everybody around right. him, and how the different characters <coughs> react yeah. to and you know some characters you know 
become allies of, of Truman's liberation and then some characters fight against it. And I, I was always very taken in that film with the struggle that you see with each character, mm -hmm. you know, because it's not, you know, the characters aren't totally black and white, like this person is evil and this person isn't. It's you kind of have a very developed sense of what everybody's incentives are and who kind of can look past their own maybe self-interest in the short term to see that there's a bigger picture of, of what's going on with Truman and Truman's liberation and how they, again, the discussion of how we are all sort of tied into everyone's mm -hmm. um, kind of spiritual sure, yeah. liberation and practice. There are, there are a couple of figures who show up in the, in the film who are what we might consider archons. Um, when he first starts to realize that something's wrong and he's trying to escape the, you know, the, the people that he sees around him, um, these guys in suits come out and start to like chase him, and, and he gets on a bus or something. I can't exactly remember. Right. But the you know I think the guys in suits are like are, are kind of archontic figures that would you know that would qualify to fit that role. Um, the other thing we didn't mention that I I think I forgot to put in the notes was what was the what was the creator's name Christoph. Christoph. Yeah. Right. You know, you know, there's a, you could say there's a somebody's trying to um, point us towards Christ with that name. We were talking about it last night, and I was I was thinking that it's a lot like um, Christo the artist, you know, because it's one name wraps, thing, wraps, wraps, wraps things yeah. around. He's one of my favorite artists. Thomas thinks he's a sham, but what what are you gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move on uh, to, I think, what everybody expects us to talk about. Yeah, we can't do this without doing The Matrix. Of course. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, well, okay, so obviously the world is fake. You know, the world is an illusion created by the machines in this case mm -hmm. um, who have vested interest in keeping humanity complicit and from, you know, exploring the world. So they have a vested interest in creating as real and a compelling an existence as possible. Um, I know we told we wouldn't talk about the second and third movies, but um, they, they do talk about that. First. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> they do talk about that a bit, that the, the first time the machines tried to create a world for the humans, they created it. It was too nice, and everybody had, a, you know, everybody had, had it easy, and it had everything they wanted, and people didn't buy it, and people were, you know... That's in the first one. They, they was it the first one? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I, they, they all run together because I watch all three of them at the same time every time I watch it. But, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so anyway, so um, Thomas Anderson is his name, right? Um, son of Man. Anderson is a son of man. Thomas being a kind of a Gnostic-y name. No, and all Thomas also meaning the twin. Meaning the twin, yeah. Uh, and then Neo, obviously, was, is what he comes to be known as, is, and Neo is meaning new, of course. Um, so it's a, a rebirth kind of uh, uh, image there. So, but it also has a certain Valentinian residence there. Mm -hmm. uh, for those we were just talking about Epiphany in the uh, in the Epiphany <coughs> story, um, the the Soter has descended and taken on some kind of body, and um, himself needs to be redeemed. He is redeemed along with the, an mm -hmm. the, the angels of the Pleroma who descended with him. And that's what happens in the waters at Epiphany. And and so he becomes a new... He himself is, he himself is redeemed or reborn in the, in the waters of Jordan. So thinking about Thomas Anderson, the son of man, being reborn, becoming Neo, becoming new, it's an image that very much resonates there. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so Neo, through Morpheus, who's uh, the god of sleep and dreams, so uh, that's, the, that's where the name Morpheus comes from, um, Morpheus awakens Neo through knowledge. It's, it's through gnosis, and a pill, but, you know, but it's knowledge. It's, it's it, the knowledge, through the knowledge that this world is fake, Neo has the, the ability to transcend it. Uh, the, the interesting thing, though, about the, the way that they treat the real world in the Matrix is not entirely Gnostic, because the real world in the Matrix, quite frankly, sucks. Well, I, I, I think there is a sense in which it is Gnostic. Because yeah, it's, well, it is, too. It's, it's clearly, he doesn't enter into um, sort of the eschatological finality of Gnostic, the, 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 yeah. the realization of the Pleroma and its fullness, what he enters into is having become awakened to the reality of the world, yeah. then enters into um, a phase of, of combating 
uh, deception and darkness, which right. is which is ugly. Right. And and so it's it's obviously his his initial awakening to the to the structure of reality doesn't bring, um, you know, some kind of floating on a cloud kind of you know fairyland happiness. It actually brings the opposite. Yes, like they say, the truth will make you free, but it will make you miserable first. Right, and that's the point that um, you know we I don't know we, we've talked about this a number of times, but it, um, gnosis isn't the end result. It's not the the destination. Gnosis begins the journey, and the journey works towards something else. Um, in in the Joe and I Church, we we talk about it as theosis. Um, you probably use similar terms right. for it. So. You have to go all the way to the third movie to see that, <laughs> but we won't talk about that. But so the the struggle, the gnosis, the awakening to the reality of the way things are, the struggle, and then in the third movie, overcomes and becomes God. He in a sense becomes the the divine, the theosis, the divinization. And and the way that he overcomes the, the these forces of darkness, the agents. Is and this I think is one of the most important parts of the movie is is, is through um, the mind in the sense of the way the mind is classically understood, not in the sense that it's understood today. Uh, today, when you talk about consciousness, people think of mind and heart, which is discursive, rational, and emotional. Um, to the to the Greeks and to the Gnostic early Gnostics, um, both of those things would be thought of as part of the psyche, the soul. But there was a higher, a higher rational faculty called the noetic faculty, the nous, um, which was a new level of consciousness. When when Jesus came and preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, the word there is metanoia, which is acquire a, a new level of nous, a new level of consciousness, because the kingdom of heaven is graspable, which makes the whole statement um, very different than the way that we classically understand it. Um, so he defeats these. Um, the agents, not through superior reasoning, because these guys are computers with high processing speed, you can't out-reason them, but it's a higher noetic faculty that gives him insight to the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. And this is what we hear of, like in the Gospel of Thomas, when it talks about the need to develop an eye in place of an eye and an ear in place of an ear, it's talking about developing new faculties of seeing and comprehension. Like, like uh, the AGC site says, Gnosis isn't just new knowledge, but it's new knowledge understood with new ways of knowing, new faculties of knowledge. It's not just having new information, it's having a new capacity for insight. And it's that insight to the nature of reality that, that gives Neo the ability to defeat the, the agents. Right. Right. Um, also, uh, there's an emphasis on stillness, which we yeah. talked about also last night. That <coughs> it isn't through actively fighting against the archons that, that that causes him to win. It's the ability to slow down and to be still and to find that still point. And that's what the bullet time. Oh, yes, yeah, so right. That yeah. They, did. Um, they make that point with with the cinematography more yeah. than anything else. Yeah. Right. Right. It, that it's. It's the stillness that allows you to overcome. Which is very, again, very Gospel of Thomas. Yeah. It talks about when you enter into the rest, then you'll reign over the all. Yep, yep. And there's a, there's a stillness even in the midst of the struggle. Mm -hmm. Yep. And in the, uh, in the cosmology of the world of the Matrix, um, the reason, the cause of the fall of, the, of humanity in the first place is human wisdom. So in, in a very right. close parallel to the, the Sethian myth and the, and the Valentinian creation myth, Wisdom creates artificial intelligence. You know, right. He says, "What is it? The whole world was united as it gave birth to AI. Yeah. Its greatest achievement, AI. Yeah. And it was AI that ended up. And so it's wisdom disconnected from reality, which is which is a retelling of the of the Sophia myth in its own way. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure most everybody here has seen The Matrix. Anybody have any other? Yes. Um, it also, I'm sorry, I can't raise my voice too much, um, but uh, it made clear that some people have the opportunity to be awakened, but they choose not to. S certainly. As in the, the, I forget his name, the traitor, yeah. who said just, you know, I want to forget all this, I just want to have a stake. Yeah. You know, he knew he had the opportunity to see reality, but he would want to remain in the false world. Right. So that some people choose ignorance. Right, because quite frankly, it's easier. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Sandy, 
<laughs> okay. So oh, terrific. Great voice. Yeah, and uh, and in this, I believe it's the second movie. Cover, cover your ears. Um, the, one of the one of the incidental characters goes up to Neo at, at, in the human city and and says, um, you know, we, and Neo is kind of a godlike figure, a Christ-like figure at this point in the story, and, and uh, the woman comes up to him and says, "Will you pray for my son? He's aboard the Gnosis." So one of the yeah. ships in the thing is called well, Gnosis. Well, right at the beginning the, of the film, when the uh, when the guy's buying oh, right. the hardware off of him, the guy the the guy who's buying the hardware says, "Yeah, you're my personal savior, Jesus Christ." Yeah. And it just kind of passes this conversation until you realize that that's who he's talking to. Right. So pretty good. Yeah. It's been a really long time <laughs> since I've seen um, the Matrix, but also isn't there something with? Um, in the be in the beginning, with also allusions to like the White Rabbit and, mm -hmm. and Alice, Alice in Wonderland, Wonderland. Yeah. And, yeah. and again the sense of you know duality, you know two Yeah, realities. there's a lot of little things like the uh, the ship when when you first uh, the first time you ever glimpse the ship, the Nebuchadnezzar in the yeah. in the first one, you get a reference to. Uh, they, they briefly show that the model number of the ship and it's mark something number whatever and if you look up that verse, verse in mark it actually refers to how spirits and unclean uh, devils and unclean spirits would flee in saying you are the son of God or the son of man or whatever the reference is yeah the, the movie's chock full of it you know you, if, you, if you look in the corners of the screen you'll see a whole bunch of these neat little things anyway. alright uh, let's move on um Let's talk about a movie I had to see twice in order to really kind of understand what was going on. Uh, Vanilla Sky. Anybody seen this one? No, I'm not entirely surprised. It's a Tom Cruise movie. Um, uh, Originally, uh, it's a remake of a Spanish movie. Right. Which was called Abre los Ojos. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. And in case you were wondering, is this a Gnostic movie? The, the, the English version with Tom Cruise in it begins with Sophie, Sophia, saying open your eyes no it's Sophia it's not Sophia is it Sophia yeah okay yeah. Sophia saying open your eyes yeah so you know sort of from the get go this is a, a clue that somebody's somebody's been reading their Nagamati yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's um just to briefly give you the synopsis Tom Cruise is a um he's the heir to a big publishing company mm -hmm. his parents uh died years ago and people kind of think he's a screw up because he kind of is um he uh, he has this kind of weird relationship with Cameron Diaz's character, and uh, Cameron Diaz's character thinks their relationship is more important than Tom Cruise's character thinks that it is. So, and she's a little bit crazy, so she drives him off a cliff, or off a bridge rather. An overpass. And, and overpass, yeah. And uh, and he ends up in, in a coma. His face is disfigured, and then he ends up in prison because they think that he killed her. Um, no, he ends up in prison because. Uh, it's very confusing because they, 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 they think that he killed Sophia they think that he killed Sophia right right but it turns out the whole world is fake anyway I told you there'd be spoilers um, so he's in he's in a dream he's dreaming he yeah. he paid a company to put him in a suspended animation um, until such time as he would be able to be his face would be and restored, they were supposed to be feeding him good dreams all this yeah. time but there's been a glitch yeah there's an error and and, and, and instead of of having these good dreams until they can revive him and fix him, he's having he's having nightmares, having nightmares. which reminds you it's a it's a very Gurdjieffian uh, approach. Gurdjieff used to say that people are are asleep and they're having nightmares. The average person you meet on the street is asleep and having nightmares, and that's exactly what the Tom Cruise figure in the film is doing. And and it's interesting that the way he has to wake up from the dream at the mm. at the end of the movie. Again, we told you there would be spoiler alerts is he has to make a leap of faith and he has to literally make a leap off a tall building yeah. and he wakes up into reality yeah he has to confront his fear of heights and jump off this building and, and um, it's an entertaining movie uh, visually very stunning um, they filmed part of it in Times Square and it was completely empty like they they cleared out Times Square and Tom Cruise is just running down the street and there's nobody no cars no taxis nothing and anyway, the opening scene of the movie is pretty interesting um, all right uh, you, so nobody's seen that one then all right go go rent it it's not bad um, okay so the Wizard of Oz well, this one I never thought of uh, really as Gnostic but uh, you know, we went through it, and it it's got a it's got quite a few 
points to it that are kind of gnostic. Well, Alfred found the first word of the book was a theosophist. So yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. It's a tie. You've got a you've got a woman who's in exile from her homeland, much like the Sophia, the Sophia myth, one of the central Gnostic stories is is, is the soul, and and Sophia Akimo in exile from the Pleroma, um, in this in this world that's an illusionary kind of place, a dream world, and um, of course the uh, you know the Gospel of Thomas talks about how. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is within you, but uh, you seek and you keep on seeking until you find, and then it's revealed to you. And you reign over the all. And of course, this is a story of of Dorothy as she continues to seek and inevitably finds. Of course, finds out that the wizard, um, the guy who's in charge of the false world, is a fraud, which is certainly one way that we would describe Sacklas or Yaldabaoth, the, the demiurge. Um, he's, he is an imposter, and he's full of hot air, just like the, the wizard was. But she also discovers that the, um, the means of her liberation had been um, at hand, or at foot, the, the entire time. And it was remembrance of her home mm -hmm. that, that, that liberated her, yeah. which, gives, which brings us back to the point of uh, anamnesis that we've talked about. One of the and, and anamnesis is a is a fascinating word because it doesn't mean remembering, it actually means unforgetting. Like amnesia, is is forgetfulness, and amnesia, is unforgetfulness. And um, just to stray off for a second, um, in in the um, institution of the Eucharist, when Jesus says, "Do this in remembrance of me," the word there in the Greek. For remember, it's translated remembrance, which makes it just sound like have a toast to Jesus, is actually anamnesis. It's an unforgetfulness, and it ties into the Platonic idea that you know the, the soul before incarnating knew its origins and knew spiritual reality and has forgotten it. And and so, part of what's happening here is is the anamnesis, the remembering of, of where your home is. And of course, she finds out that she's always had the means of liberation, mm -hmm. and her companions find out that they always had what they were looking for. The lion was always brave. The tin man always had a heart. The scarecrow was always bright. And um, and it took the quest for them to, to discover that within them. Mm -hmm. I think the next couple of movies that we're going to talk about are very similar in this kind of a theme. Um, it, it's it's the hymn of the pearl, you know, that you mm -hmm. read from in the, the Acts of Thomas and the Apostles, uh, or in India, I think it's the the book that comes from, right? Acts of Thomas and the Apostles. Um, I wanted to add something to her. name is Dorothy. I believe that means gift of God, doesn't it? In Greek, Dorothea. Dor is gift. Yeah. Gift. Theos, Dorotheos, and yeah, Thea is God. God. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I guess that's also significant. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Anybody else want to add anything about Wizard of Oz? 1937? No. 39. 39. Yeah. Um, it's, not in the, it's not in the movie, but in the book. Um, one of the things that happens is when they go to the Emerald City, they have to put on these green goggles, yeah. and, 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 and you know the idea that the Emerald City really isn't this Emerald City, but that you know the false wizard yeah. makes you put on something over your eyes to mediate the way that you see the world. Wow. And the act That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. and the, the act yeah, yeah, of putting right. the glasses on and off, and I think there's some other, um, you know, there's some other examples I can think of in pop literature and film where, you know... Well, there's Kant's oh, blue spectacles. Yeah, mm. like obscuring vision and, and right. you know, Shield. having something that mediates the way that you mm. interact with your reality. Right. Huge you anti peril sensitive sunglasses will prevent you from seeing anything which could alarm you. Actually, there was a movie called Them, and Roddy Piper yeah. played in it, and you had... You had to put That's on these point. glasses to see the world how it really is. Yeah, and see all Not the aliens. I thought them was giant ants. It was like a no, no. Was it, was it they live or them? It may, maybe it was they live. I don't know. All I remember is he came to kick ass and chew bubble gum, and he's all out of bubble gum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I, I had forgotten about that movie, but that might be one to add to the list later. <laughs> 
But anyway, okay. So let's let's move on to the next movie, which is one of my favorite Gnostic movies, which is not for the faint of heart, Pan's Labyrinth. Um, oh, I got yes. it. Yeah. Um, it's a terrific movie. There are parts of it that you know, I've seen a lot of gory movies. Parts of that make me cringe. There are only a couple of them, but they're like it's not a kids movie. It's not a kids very movie. Very dark. Yeah, very very dark. dark. It takes place during the Spanish Revolution, um, and it's the story of a little girl and her mother who travel to um, this kind of disputed area where there's the you know rebels on one side and the army on the other, and they're they're fighting and. Um, the, the mother is marrying a general, I, I believe yeah. it was, in the Spanish army. And um, she has, uh, well, anyway, and so the mother thinks this is going to make the, the child secure and everything. But the child has a very vivid imagination. And um, I didn't write down her, Ophelia is the child's name. And um, Ophelia has, is obsessed with fairy tales and she's always reading books and everything. Ophelia wanders off one night following this kind of insect thing, fairy, insect, whatever it happens to be, and finds um, a labyrinth. And at the center, this pan figure, this kind of goat man figure in the center, uh, says, oh my goodness, you're the, you're the princess that we've lost all this time ago. We've been, we've been here on Earth looking for you, and finally we found you. Um,